Good evening and welcome. Today we shall be reading the short story Herbig Haro by Harry Turtledove. This is also the sequel to his other short story, The Road Not Taken. So, we begin. Herbig Haro. Uh, Eric G. Iverson, in brackets, Harry Turtledove. So this was written under a pseudonym. Let's begin. Like all the ships, Loki flew. Erasmus Chang's scout, Praise of Folly, was too old. She went into or out of hyperdrive with a jolt that twisted a man's guts. Her air recycler wheezed, and she had a 5% waver in her pseudo-gravity, so Chang's weight went through a 7-kilo cycle every 20 minutes. The computer was old, too, in a way. That was an advantage, but, sorry, in a way that was an advantage. The navigation data programmed in were Terran Confederacy, the most far-reaching set, even if it was 600 years out of date. But after enough time, memory dumps, or no, a computer will develop a personality of its own. The current flows get set. Chang did not trust his machine very far. It was a cynically underhanded, sorry, it was as cynically underhanded as he was. Well, hero, we're still gaining, it said with what he thought was misplaced amusement. I can see that for myself, thanks, he growled. He paced up and down the cabin, a lean, trim man, a bit below middle height, whose wide, high cheekboned face was framed by a thin fringe of black beard. Uh, black, yeah, black beard. Pace as he would, though his eyes kept coming back to the hyperdrive detector. There was little enough else to see. With the drive on, none of the normal space instruments worked. The four glowing points in the detector display were Xanat warships. One he might have challenged. Taking on four was sheer suicide, and he could ill afford it. Loki and all the worlds in human space needed to know about the Xanat. <clears throat> Unfortunately, they would overtake him long before he could deliver the news, long before he got out of the Orion Nebula, for that matter. He punched for a sandwich, ate it. When he looked at the FTL, that's faster than light, display again, the four warships had slid a little closer. <sighs> I wish I'd chosen a different bar, he said. You aren't the only one, the computer told him. As soon as the shave-tail lieutenant had stepped into the London pub, Chang knew his leave was doomed. The youngster was in uniform, which meant he was on duty, and Kluing was the only serviceman in the dive. Just my luck, he thought sourly. Run a successful mission and not get the chance to celebrate. The load of books, cassettes, and floppy disks he'd snaked out of the Cathedral of Cienfuegos deserved celebrating, too. Old floppies, especially, were more precious than gold. Even the Cienfuegos remembered that much. They'd mounted the disks above the altar by the statues of their gods. <laughs> Considering how outdated floppy disks are in 2018... I find this hilarious, but this short story was written a long time ago. Still, it has aged well, considering there was deliberate irony in aliens worshipping outdated Earth technology. <laughs> Continuing. The scout pilot was still fuming when the lieutenant brought him back to Salvage Service Central. Baikal thought it was very funny. Where did he find you? The London pub or Nadia's? The London pub, Chang sighed. This, uh, that his habits were known did not surprise him. He would have been surprised had it been otherwise. Baikal looked him over, cocked a critical eyebrow. <laughs> That's not much of a beard either, friend. The scout pilot put a defensive hand to his chin. He had grown the whiskers of the Suenfuegos to make himself less conspicuous there, and was quite proud of them. In spite of his name, he had enough co uh, co uh, caucasoid genes to let him raise a fair crop. Oh, so he's like half Chinese, half white, I see. 
the day you start telling me how to wear my hair, you old harridan, is the day I get out of the service. Baikal laughed out loud, a bad sign. Things that amused her generally meant trouble for other people. She was a plump black woman with straight graying hair, the head of which was euphemistically known as the Loki Salvage Service. Loki's few friends called the service a band of scavengers. Everyone else started with names like pirates, thieves, spies, and went downhill from there. Having wasted enough time on pointless chatter, Baikal waved Chang to a chair by the big hollow tank that took up most of one wall. He sat with the same feeling he had whenever he was in her office, that of being in the center of a spider's web. Watching the spider at work. Being on the same side helped only a little in that regard. What's gone wrong? he asked bluntly. Sure, she would not have recalled him without pressing reason. Operatives got their chance to royster between missions. She punched a button on her desk. The hollow tank sprang to life with a view of that small chunk of the galaxy humans had touched. Stars with planets that were thought from any source, however ancient, to have been settled by men were shown in blue. Those about which Loki actually knew something flashed on and off. Red marked the suns of non-human species that used the hyperdrive. Yellow, those of planet-bound races. Most others were omitted. The white points here and there were stars with absolute magnitudes bright enough to make them useful navigation checks over many light years of distance. She moved a veneer, touched another control. One of the winking blue points flared brighter for a moment. Sin fuegos, she said unnecessarily. I've listened to your report. A good run. Thank you, ma'am. He waited. The compliment was another danger signal. Anything she had to get around to by easy stages was bound to be dicey. Not for her, of course, but for him. His suspicion was confirmed when four brilliant orange points sprang to life beyond the glowing mist of the Orion, Neg uh, Orion Nebula, which dimmed to show their location more clearly. At last, she said, as well as I can judge, those spots mark where we've lost ships in the past two days. Oh, that's impossible. Cloying, uh, pardon me, it's either cloying or, ch oh yeah, cloying, blurted. There are no human worlds out there. Loki itself was 200 light years terraward from the nebula, and hardly any blue points lay between it and the great cloud of gas. Impossible is not a word used to describe what's already happened, Baikal said, in mild reproof, as though to a student who should know better. But Chang's protest died unspoken. Baikal knew the obvious as well as he. Starships in hyperdrive flew blind, of course. There were always the chance of returning to normal space coincident with solid matter. It was a very long one, though. Aliens might have worked up a trick good enough to snare one ship, he thought. But hardly four. Not with the technological leap humans had, and especially humans from a planet like Loki, which still kept most of the skills of the long-dead confederacy. That left nothing he could see. Baikal spoke with seeming irreverence. Do you know the poem, The Road Not Taken, by an English writer named Frost? I've never heard of it. You might look up a modern translation when you leave. This frost person could have been looking a hundred years into his own future. The galactic map dis disappeared from the hollow tank. A scratchy, flat image replaced it. A crowded city scene, with swarms of humans in strange clothes, both civilian and military, milling about at a cautious distance from a starship of a make Chang did not recognize. A pretty crude one, he thought. This is Tokyo the first Roxlani landing on Terra. It might just as well be Cairo, New York, Moscow, Shanghai, or 20 other cities. The year was AD 2039, Baikal said softly. Seeing that the archaic date meant nothing to Kluing, she added, 
Year 45 pre-Confederacy. He whistled. No wonder the video was scratchy. It was over 1,200 years old. He wondered how many times it had been re-recorded. In the picture, the ship's ramp was lowering. You can imagine the Terran's anxiety, Baikal said dryly. They'd been radioing the Roxlani since the fleet came out of hyperdrive in the solar system. Chang nodded. Naturally, they'd gotten no reply. Out came the Roxlani, a platoon of stout, furry humanoids in high-crowned helmets and steel corsets. They moved with the precision of veteran troops, shaking themselves into a skirmish line. At a shouted command from an officer wearing scarlet ribbons on his arm and fancy plumes, they raised their weapons to their shoulders and fired into the Terrans. Chang heard the ancient screams. Undoubtedly, the man holding the video set ducked for his life, for the picture jerked and twisted, but the scout pilot saw the clouds of black powder smoke float into the sky. The Terran soldiers around the starship returned fire automatically, opening up with small arms, rocket and grenade launchers, and recoilless shells from the armored fighting vehicle that had somehow squeezed into a position nearby. When the video straightened, the starship was holed and all but two of the aliens down. The surviving the survivors gaped at their fallen comrades. Neither had made the slightest move to reload his musket. Reading non-humans' body language was always tricky, but Chang knew stunned horror when he saw it. The road not taken, Baikal murmured. Back then, on Terra, they knew faster-than-light travel was impossible forever. It was a rude shock when they found that a couple of simple experiments could have given them the key to contra-gravity contra and the hyperdrive three, four, or even five centuries earlier. But how did they miss them? Chant, uh, it's a chant asked. That's got to be Chang. It's got to be a typo. No idea. In hindsight, they're obvious enough. What What is that race that flew bronze ships because they couldn't smelt iron, and every species we know that reached what the old Terrans would have called a 17th century technological level did what was needed, all except us. But trying to explain contragravity and the hyperdrive skews an unsophisticated developing physics out of shape. With attention focused on them, too, Work on other things, like electricity and atomics, never gets started, and those have much broader applications. The others are only really good for moving things from here to there in a hurry. With a chuckle, Chang said, we must have seemed like angry gods when we finally got the hyperdrive and bust off Terra. Radar, radio, computers, fission and fusion bombs, no wonder we spent the next 200 years conquering. <laughs> No wonder at all, Baikal agreed soberly. But the Confederacy grew too fast and got too big to administer, even with all the technology we had, and unity didn't last forever. None of our neighbors could hurt us, but we did a fine job on ourselves. Someone back then wrote that it was only sporting for humans to fight humans. No one else gave us any competition. And so, the collapse... Chang said. And here we are, on Loki and a few other worlds, pick, picking over the pieces, a scrap from here, a fragment from there, and one day we'll have the puzzle pulled all together again, or maybe orientated into a new shape, better than the one before, if we ever get the time. But those four missing ships frighten me. That was a word Chang had never heard her use before. I still don't see how they disappeared. There's no one out there. Correction. There's no one we know of, Baikal corrected. But I keep thinking that a road traveled once might be traveled twice. As he, as he took her meaning, Chang felt the little hairs at the nape of his neck trying to stand up. She finished low and fierce. Find out what happened, and come back alive. That's an order. Any other little favors you'd like? Praise of Folly's computer had demanded when Chang described the mission. Shall I write the suicide note too, sir? I won't go, I tell you. 
I'd end up in the scrapper there just as much as you. Shall I shift into override mode? Chang snapped, in no mood for back talk from the computer. No, please don't, the computer said with poor grace. It always leaves me slow and stupid for a couple of days afterwards. Surly was a better word, the scout pilot thought, but he held his peace. The takeoff was as smooth as takeoffs under contragravity always are. The shift into hyperdrive, as brutal as all the others praise of folly had been making lately. Chang staggered into the head and threw up. When he came out, he asked plaintively, Isn't there any way to smooth that out? Of course, sir, the computer said. Get me the parts and... Chang grunted. Loki's own shipyards turned out decent craft, but some techniques of precision manufacturing had yet to be rediscovered. If one of the old Confederacy ships went wrong, repairs weren't likely to do much good. Despite praise of Folly's tape library, travel under hyperdrive was brutally dull. The computer played chess at a setting that let Chang win about half the time, until one day he escaped from a trap it thought it sh that he thought he couldn't have seen. Then it trounced him six times running, adding insult to injury by moving the instant he took his finger off a piece. After that, it seemed satisfied, and went back to a level mere mortals could match. From time to time, other ships showed up on the detector. Most of them never sensed praise of folly. Confederacy instrumentation handily outranged non-human or post-collapse gear. Once, though, two vessels made a chase of it. <sighs> Damn pirates, Chang growled, and outran them with ease. He approached his planned emergency point obliquely, not wanting any observers to track his course back to Loki. The jolt on leaving hyperdrive was not as bad as the one entering it, nor at least not quite. Now what, the computer said. The view screen showed a totally unfamiliar conflagration of stars. Even the Orion Nebula was not as Chang knew it, for he was seeing the side opposite the one it presented to human space. He shrugged. Make for the nearest main sequence G or K class star, he said, and gagged as praise of folly returned to hyperdrive. The first yellow-orange sun proved without habitable planets. So did the second and the third. A lean region, Chang thought. He was on his way to the fourth when the detector picked up the alien squadron. Excitement and alarm coursed through him. From the brilliance of the blips on the screen, those were sizable ships. They were making good speed, too. Far better than most of the non-human craft he, in his, he knew. He held his course and waited to be noticed. In short order, he was. The strangers had sensitive detectors. Three vessels peeled off from the main group towards him. He took no evasive action. He was looking for contact. Fool that I am, he said to no one in particular. The lead ship's field, pardon me, the lead ship's drive field touched his. They were both thrown back into normal space. Gulping, Chang wondered whether the aliens were subject to nausea as well. The two ships emerged on divergent vectors several thousand kilometers apart. That would have been enough to make it impossible for most of the aliens the scout pilot knew to find him in the vastness of space. But the stranger swiftly altered course and came after him. I'm picking up radar, the computer reported. Oh, wonderful, Chang said morosely. As usual, Baikal had been right. The other two ships must have slaved their engines to their detector screens, for they returned to normal space at the same instant as their comrade and praise of folly. Chang's radar soon found them. They closed rapidly. Radio traffic, the computer said. The whistles and growls that came out of the speaker sprang from no human throat. Let's give him something to think about. Chang recorded his name and the name of the ship. Squirt that out on their frequency and see what happens. There were several seconds of absolute silence, then a burst of alien noise that sounded much more excited than the previous signals. 
Chang wondered if the non-humans had learned English or low Mandarin from any of the earlier pilots they'd captured. If so, they were not letting on. The incomprehensible babble continued. Then alarms hooted and the computer was shouting, Missile away, missile away. A moment later it reported, Contragrav job, fairly good velocity but a clean miss, trajectory far ahead of us. Just the one launch? The scout pilot asked tensely. So far. Praise of Folly was a confirmed pessimist. Might be a shot across our... A new star bloomed in the forward screen. A supernova burst that went from white through the yellow and orange to red and slowly gutted out. Fission explosion, the computer said, matter-of-factly. 30 kiloton range. Chang held his head in his hands. Not just electronics, eh? Then, the aliens had a grasp of nuclear physics as well. He could not imagine anything worse. It lit up these, praise the fo folly said. Another screen came on, its image grainy with high magnification. The scout pilot did not recognize the craft displayed, but he knew warships when he saw them. They blistered with launchers and also sported two turrets each. Quick-fire guns for close-in work, he guessed. He weighed his options. Even winning a stand-up fight would not give him enough information to make Baikal happy. Meekly stopping, pardon me, meekly stopping, though, stuck in his craw. They may as well be as worried as I am, he decided. Give the lead ship a peewee at about the same distance that they put theirs, but throttle down the missiles so, they're, so that theirs seems to outperform it. He did not intend to show all of his cards to the enemy. So this concludes the short story, Her Big Haro by Harry Turtledove, which is a sequel to The Road Not Taken and is set over a thousand years later. And despite that, still manages to sort of put a, paint together a picture of what the world and the universe looks like. And it's honestly very intriguing, and I wish he had continued with it, but evidently he has not. And that is unlikely to change, assuming the man is still alive. I don't know if he is. In any case, thank you for joining us, and have a wonderful evening.